Hi everyone, welcome to Unity of Ocala. I'm here with Jean Joyner, our faithful servant and good steward of everything these days. I told her she needs to start delegating, so don't be surprised if you get a call from one of us that we need some help, because she's, and Shirley, and Joanne and Don are pretty much running everything. And so we bless them, we thank them. Shirley's here. Happy birthday, Shirley. Happy Yesterday birthday. was her celebration. We got to see Don and Marianne for two seconds. They brought in muffins and then <laughs> left again. So it's nice to see a few folks. Let's begin our time together with prayer and just get centered and ready to receive. <sighs> just relax and allow everything to melt away for now. This is your time. Your time for that infill of beautiful spirit, God's holy presence and light, which is already in us. So let's just acknowledge that and be reminded of that holy presence that we notice more fully when we become still. Open your heart for gratitude for the gifts that constantly pour into our life and into our world, even in the seeming darkness. God is here, real, ready, always loving, always lifting, always guiding. For this knowing, we are so grateful and so honored and blessed to do God's work. Thank you, God, amen. And thank you all for your faithfulness to us and to our journey as we continue to be part of the solution as we collectively heal and help others heal. And your board made some great decisions at the meeting yesterday, one especially that you'll celebrate with us, helping the homeless and those that need extra food during this ordeal. It's a, it's a program that fills these backpacks full of foods and the board Personal care items. And personal care items for these people that in, in big need, especially now with all that's going on. And your board has agreed to do two of its months this summer of tithing to them, but we need the support of you too to help even restock those supplies and get this necessary food and self-care items to them. So thank you for tithing and sending in. And if you want to earmark that, for this project and this effort, that is fine, along with your regular tithes. Thank you, they're going a long way to help heal this community and support and love our Unity community and our extended family in the community. So thank you, we love you. So how have you been doing during this season of change and the whole Tish Beyond energy that we spoke about last week? I know you've been feeling it. I'm hearing from all of you. I'm hearing from people I haven't heard of in years that what is going on? Can it get any darker? <laughs> well, hopefully not because Tishbiov is over. Good riddance, Tishbiov. Thank you for your work of ringing in that time of darkness, embracing it, doing the necessary work of going within your heart and feeling the pain, not just of your own, and of your own grieving, but of the world and all those others. It is not until we are able, this is what the mystics teach us. Jesus taught this so beautifully in his active ministry. Until we feel that pain, until we immerse ourselves in that grief, we cannot be the brightest light for these communities. If we don't have that level of empathy and compassion, we are not bringing the greatest light because there is still an element that is holding back. So Tish Biyar, that, Biyar, that darkest day of the Jewish calendar is a reminder annually that it is the darkness that we must go in together in order to come to a brighter reckoning and realization of God's work and wonder. And it's so profound to realize and to become friends with the darkness instead of pushing it away because we push it away and push it away and pretend it's not there and just right along the top of these waves with the earthquakes underneath as if everything's fine. I love that book. I can't think of the author, but I'll bring it next week if I can find it. All you see is her pretty face, perfect makeup, perfect hair on the cover of her book. And yeah, and there's water up to here. 
and everything in her life is floating and she's going, I'm fine. <laughs> and that's a profound reminder that that's us collectively. There are a lot of people in pain. Yes, a lot of us are going through extraordinary pain. I feel, because I speak with the people, I feel especially for these first responders who are having to turn families away at the hospitals so they can care for their patients. And some of them make their transition. Sometimes it's children that are mentally challenged that don't understand what's going on or why these families aren't with them. And these nurses and these doctors have to hold them and be with them in a whole new way. So I allowed myself, ooh, to get into that muck and to talk with them and feel that and cry with them. And it was such a relief for us because then they felt, I'm being heard. Other people feel it. It's not just my coworkers in this sea of endlessness, but there's a world out there that loves us. And what that does when we connect to pain in that way, it brings our pain up too, and we can release it. God does not want us to live in pain. Pain is only there to show us how fabulous things can be and remind us to be humble, especially with those going through it. So Tishbiav is not something to fear, even though it feels icky. It's a cavern that we get sunk and drug into. We want to escape it. We can embrace it. We can trust that God is bringing us through. And if we open and allow it and feel it, we can heal it and we can rise above it. So that's the lesson that I've learned to embrace the darkness. And it's been my biggest fear. And I go back to the garden and I think of that beautiful seed without the compression of the heavy, dark earth and the busting of that seed pod, that light cannot enter. That seed cannot find its way. The Jewish people have a term for that darkness. It's like a shell that encases us. It's called klepa. And it's that shell of the bird's egg that must be broken. The crust has to be broken in order for the life to go on. And you'll notice that in that seed, the sprout, as soon as it breaks free from that crust, from the compression and the earth and the need that something in there is coming, Mother Nature knows when it's time. And here goes that break. And the little chip will work on getting the rest of the shell broken. But the seedling, as soon as it senses light, will start shooting towards the light and the roots go dark and deep and deeper and darker. They are no longer afraid to extend into the darkness because they know that that darkness brings greater light. That's our journey. We can learn so much from that. And the great news is that this Tuesday, the third, starts to be of which is the 15th of Av, actually. It follows the 9th of Av, which is the darkest, because we're entering the month of Leo, which has a two-part meaning in the Jewish tradition, but also in the Hindu tradition. I was speaking to my Taoist priest S friend on the phone right after Tish became, became towards the light. We connected after several years of not connecting. She just said I was supposed to call you, and Jean and or yeah, Jean and I were just talking about her the other day, and here she pops up on my phone, and we had a delicious conversation about the extraordinary light that comes when the realization and the embracing of the darkness occurs, because it is in that deepest point of, I give up, I am being crushed under the earth, my shell is cracking, and people will call it a breakdown, we in these traditions call it a breakthrough, because we know we must break through that. There is nothing as beautiful or as painful as birth. And that is what is collectively happening. And when we begin to shed that clip off, something extraordinary begins to happen. And this dual power month of Av brings the greatest darkness and the end of the year. It is time to turn that chapter. Sometimes time to end that book and put it back on the shelf and get a fresh new page, or at least a new chapter. This is the opening to something great, and there are a few spiritual tools that we can access that help us 
to achieve and to realize and to channel the greatest light. That embracing the darkness and feeling the pain that the world is feeling and not just helping ourselves through the pain, but the ability to reach beyond for the sake of the greater good is what gives us access to the greatest light. And if you have ever been around a true student of this work, a true mystic or master, her great teacher, oh, Master, master Chen, I had the opportunity to meet him. He is a holy man of holy men from the Taoist tradition. He is in Asia, his home base is China, but he comes to Denver, to the mountains outside of Denver occasionally to do some of his teachings for his American students. And she, my dear friend, was one of his students and she would travel there to his seminary there, his temple there in Colorado. And, and, and she spent years, it takes years and years and years to be a priestess at that level. And she would come back and we would spend days together discussing Master Chen. I had the opportunity to not only meet him, but do a ceremony with him, the marriage of her and her husband here in Florida on the beach. He traveled here, I got to meet him, and I'll tell you, it was the most extraordinary experience. If you have ever been around, this is the closest Dalai Lama I have been around, and he just exudes this energy of love and joy. I mean, I, had, I just never had felt a, a joyous spirit like that in my life. We met on this beach outside of Indian Rocks, and it was a tourist-filled beach. I mean, this was several years ago, but all the hotels were there, these regular standard hotels that you see. This man, we were both in these robes. He had a long white robe with this bright blue sash that he had wound around his waist, and he had a matching sash that pulled up his long hair into a beautiful little bun-like knot. He was just, round little face, just the epitome of what you would see or think of in a Taoist priest of that level. He didn't speak English, but I could he, I could understand what he was talking about. All he was was joy. He was so joyous at being there. I and mean, then here's this studied, holy worshiped man who is just like a child. And he drew, he got seaweed. He, he's just out gathering these twigs of seaweeds off of the shores. And he made this huge yin yang symbol there as the temple. And did the division and the and the two markings of balance and he and i were the only ones allowed to enter that and he would just do this to me and i just i even forgot i was supposed to be part of it i was just so in awe of him he had his um students his elders put up four rows of chairs and there were eight seats in each of the four rows and he put this this large lantern, you know, one of those outdoor lanterns that you light, four of those behind the chairs representing the elements. He expressed to me in sign language that the sand, the earth and fire and wind and water, and he's doing this. Those were the four elements. Those directly behind he and I were left empty for the ancestors. And he explained to me, you know, I, I understood the ancestors and because um, they will be, they, they want to be invited and they need to be honored. And then the rest were for the guests. But what he did, uh, the service was so profound and all that was in the service, um, besides the two of us, was a little ring boy and the bride and groom who had not entered yet. But what he did just before that, he prayed in the center of that and he just looked at me and smiled. And then he ran over by where all the people were and he said in his plain of English as he could manage, he said, oh, never, never before seen, get your cameras, east and west meets and marries, never before, <laughs> click, 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 and he's just encouraging, and people were laughing and clapping, and I was just watching him enjoy every second of this, and I was just learning so much by absorbing his energy and his joy, and then he came to the altar, and he looked at me, and he said, I pray, you pray, and I said, okay, so we both in silent prayer, and then the groom and the ringmaster, the little guy carrying the ring came in and they stood at my side. The nurse came in and stood at his side. And it was just this exchange of love that was so powerful. And so being able to speak with her again about the traditions 
of this joint spiritual adventure that we are all on and how all these traditions weave together in the same amazing way, this tapestry and this part of Tishbiav turning into Tubiav, which the other side of this month of the lion, this 30 days of back and forth, is so powerful because it sets the course for the next year. Because right after this is the Rosh Kadesh and we're going into Rosh Hashan and then the Holy New Year and a brand new phase for all of us. I mean, isn't that profound that all of this is happening right now at this time, not just with Christianity and Judaism, but all the traditions. It's, it's fabulous. So what to expect coming up? <laughs> On Tuesday, we again light the candle as we transition out of the darkness. And there are a few, like I said earlier, a few spiritual tools that we can use that really honor our unity tradition and how we can make the most of the availability of God's greatest light. Oftentimes, we block our, well, all the time, we block ourselves from our spiritual guides, from the words of wisdom that are constantly coming to us in all of our senses and spiritual senses, we are receiving guidance and understanding. But we block it, not intentionally, but we block it when we do certain things and act in certain ways that are counterproductive to that. It warps the way we perceive it. Does that make sense? In this month especially, what is available to us is that inner spiritual power of hearing. This is what Jesus was talking about when he said, those with ears, let them hear, because I need them to hear right now. That is what these spirits are encouraging us, these guides are encouraging us. Right now, we are getting shaken to the core so we can begin to hear with spiritual ears above the fray. And you'll notice that as you go through life, your senses begin to dull in certain areas. They take on your ears, for example. They take on the dirt in the environment, the pollution, the toxins, through the noise, through the air, in the forms of wax. The Indians call it ama. It collects in our bodies and of our bodies. And the same happens with our spiritual senses, our spiritual and our physical eyes. When we get clear, we are able to hear above the noise. We are able to hear what nature is whispering, what mother nature, what our creator, what our spiritual guides are saying. We are be able, we're able to see with more clarity what is going on from a distance. Like when I was talking about when you start painting and getting into the other side of the brain and without trying to create a picture, when you just push some paint around, you'll begin to see an image forming. And your idea that you thought that picture was gonna be transforms into something totally different. It transforms into what it wants to be, what it was already intending to be if you get out of that left brain and let it be. My students know this, that, that if, they, if they give it time, they back up and they, oh, and then it's easy to just fill in because that's coming from a higher understanding. It's your higher self saying, let's, let's do this with the picture. It is the same with our spiritual sense of hearing. And so this second part of honoring and allowing the greatest light is about opening our spiritual ears by undoing the damage. Some of the things that cause the greatest damage to our spiritual hearing is gossip, participating in and listening to, because it takes us from seeing a higher vision of that person and who they are to God and brings us here to a limited zone of what is being bombarded to us. It is also giving to receive something back that blocks and tends to damage our receptors to receive because we want to fast quick. And otherwise, I'll tithe so that I get lots of money back. That's how most of us tithers start tithing. I need money, I need prosperity, I need love, I'm gonna tithe money, I'm gonna tithe love, I'm gonna tithe time. You know, we, we give out what we need to receive because that's the law of attraction and it works. But it's so much more when we consider that that gift is not so we'll get something back. This gift is to God and we can't outgift God and we don't know where that gift's gonna go and how many millions and billions it's gonna bless. So when we let go of the attachment, well, I'm not gonna give to them because they may go buy another drink. <laughs> so how's that gonna help them? Yeah, that might be the drink that sends them to the bottom and they get help. We don't know. 
if we are encouraged to give gifts, don't question it, don't be motivated by getting anything back, and watch what begins to happen in your life. It is profound because we're all one. It takes doing this to get it, to understand it. And when we as a society, that tipping point, and we're getting there, believe it or not, it doesn't sound like it or feel like it. When we get to the tipping point where more people understand the power of that, we're gonna see the, the, the collective and community consciousness raise. That's what unity is about. It's not about raising numbers and gobs of money. It's about raising consciousness. So everything we need is there constantly. And it starts by realizing the darkness, embracing it, having the ability and courage and faith to let those roots go really deep so that you can begin to see a light above everything. Have you ever noticed a lily in a mucky, mucky pond? It's the most exquisite flower you can paint because it's just so magical. And it grows through this muck, deep into the muckiest muck of mucks, <laughs> and just lifts its face like this to the sun. That's nature saying, look at the lily. Jesus would say that, consider the lily constantly. We are in this together, so how do we do that? Well, I did it the other day without realizing it, and I got a call from my daughter, because I'm working in my daughter's shop. She is a captain, works with a group of captains on the Homosassa River. She owns a shop there. They have five boats, she and her business partner. They co-own this business. It's a fabulous business. Tourists just love it. It's scallop season right now, so they've got tours going out every day, and I'm helping in the shop because they're so busy. And They hire lots of other captains that, that come in and take these tours, and at the end of the day, and I sell the little souvenirs, and artists bring in their work, and I get to meet these fabulous people, and we have all the snorkel gear and all the fun stuff. I mean, it's just a hoot. So at the end of the day, these captains will come back and they'll start giggling about the tours they did. And, you know, I had a group from Europe. They were so funny. I mean, it's just fun to listen to their stories. And my daughter and one of the other captains was still out on a tour, but the other ones were in and they were waiting on them. They were probably going to go over to the favorite watering hole of all the captains and pirates, which is around the corner. And I was getting ready to close. And I heard a couple of the gals just like little hands in the hen house. They all call me mama. Everybody there calls me mama. And... They're, I love being around a bunch of strong women captain that verge on pirates and captains because they're very protective of the waterway. And they go out with, with fog horns when you're doing something. If, if you're speeding in a manatee zone, if you're not wearing reef safe sunscreen, if you've got bottles in your boat, if you know they're, ah, they're I love being with these ladies. But they get cackling like little hens sometimes. I walked by one of them in the store and they were trashing another captain, another outfit, which probably rightfully so. They're not very ethical. They do things that are that are not good for the animals and the wildlife, and they put a bad light on the whole industry. So, but anyways, they say, isn't that right, mama? And I just went, oh, I don't go there. And I went on about my business, and <laughs> I got a call later from Lacey, and she said, mama, did you scare my girls? And I was like, what? What did I do? <laughs> I didn't know I did anything. She's like, no, I just started laughing because one of them said, oh, your mama doesn't go for gossip or negative talk. She threw her hands up and walked outside and Lacey started laughing. She said, what did you guys do? <laughs> well, I was just talking about, you know, and, and she was, no, mama won't go down that road. She's not going to let people talk about other people. And I didn't realize that I had really done that. And I thought, I really missed an opportunity to teach what, you know. So I had an opportunity to be with that particular captain again the next day. I saw her and I said, I I'm really sorry if I offended you or hurt your feelings. I didn't mean to be rude. She said, oh, no, 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 you weren't rude. She said, you know, we get going and we don't even realize we're doing that. And I said, oh. I said, well, how does that feel when you do that? And she said, it, and I loved what she said because it's perfect. She said, you know, it feels kind of sticky, <laughs> like icky with a you know, and I said, yeah, I, my spiritual teachings teach me that words have power and have to be taken with that power. And so everything we put out there, we bring to us. And she said, I'm just glad you shared that with me. So maybe it did some good, but I have to be careful also of how I present to this material. So we're gonna go into a time of meditation because I really want us to go into this valley and be able to see the light from a different point of view. And I'm just gonna leave our time together with just a little 
quote, a short quote I found in the parabola that has been what I have experienced with darkness. And I'm sure you have as well. And it is from Mark Gaffney and the power of the path of yearning. In the valley of the shadow of death, I have not found the certainty of God. I am not bathed in the glorious light of certainty. It is in the longing, the pain of the lack of God, that I find God. Find God by giving this week. <laughs>